welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley, founder and owner of GC Realty. Mark, happy Monday morning. Yes, we are recording this on Monday morning at 9 a.m. I don't, I don't think we recorded too many on Monday. Uh, at least the feeling that I feel today, I don't think I felt of like coming in. Now, I kind of like it because the week hasn't stressed me out. The day hasn't gotten moving yet. Everyone hasn't responded back to all the emails I sent over the weekend. So I kind of like it. I feel, I feel a little fresh. So maybe if anyone has any feedback on uh, if they like our Monday morning show, we'll, we'll take that feedback. <laughs> I like it too. I, I, I actually got to go to, uh, I was out in Pilsen. I never go down that way. I was down there last night. I was at Thalia Hall for a concert and it's oh, awesome no down there. Oh, what, what, uh, who'd you say? So the old 97s, which I think we mentioned on a previous podcast. So a pl- plug for them. Cause they're, they're awesome. Not no Chicago roots, nothing really related to the show, but yeah, yesterday went to Pilsen for, for the concert, went to Lincoln square for Apple fest with the kids. And I was running around Lincoln park for one of our jobs. So it was, uh, got to see the city. Got, got, got to go all around yesterday. Poster board for exploring the neighborhoods. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it ties into our episode, kind of. It does. Yep. That's why n- listeners won't hear it, but I, my voice cracked on the first welcome because uh, I think I lost my voice a little. <laughs> no, they'll hear that in the blooper reel that uh, we'll have Javier post out there. <laughs> what uh, Enough of this goofiness. What do we got for the housing provider tip of the week? Yes. So my tip for the week, you know, maybe I'm uh, getting older and, and more sensitive, but you know what? I, you are, I sold a, uh, one of our clients, a previous guest on the show, bought a five unit million dollar building in a class a neighborhood, uh, last week. And I end up being the broker on the deal, which we're going to invite everyone, all the, we're going to have fun with that one, that whole deal. I kind of had the mindset going through the whole transaction of having the attorney, the listing agent, me as a selling agent, uh, the lender, which was uh, Renovo, us all having here like on a round table breaking down that deal. So I'm looking forward to that. But at the end of that, that uh, the, the deal closed last Friday, it was like four o'clock. I'm driving home. I'm like, man, what a great day for this investor. Like, and, and I think my next call was to him to kind of tell him like, hey man, you just bust your butt to get to this. You know, It was a long drawn out and you guys will all hear a story, but you bust, you, we all bust our butts to get to the closing table. And a lot of times that, that win is overshadowed by all the work you have to do now or the money that's not in your account anymore. But you know, when you buy like this property that he bought, this five unit, like what a win. He found an awesome deal. He got it to the finish line and he'll have this property in his portfolio probably for 20 years. And, and this will this will write him a lot of different checks in a lot of different ways over the years. So my my tip is really to make sure that uh, you're celebrating those wins. Uh, you know, Closing day is a huge win, whether you're buying a single family for yourself, or you're buying a two, your first two flat. Honestly, this is probably his uh, 10th closing he's had, but it's still a really good day. And, and don't let, uh, you know, he, Enjoy the journey. It's part of the journey. So enjoy the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with that more. I, I like to do the dinner the night of, whether I go with my wife or whoever, like just you know, treat yourself for the for the win. The, the other little dopamine thing, you can't really see it here, but I got the uh I got the board behind me and I put a pin in for each job. And for whatever reason, that gives me the little that, that I get really excited to put the pin in or have my kids do it. Like, we got another one. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. I love how you involve the kids. So all right. We got a good one today. Mark, we've gone a hundred and something episodes here without ever talking about appliances. I don't know how we made it this far. That's because this is something that every investor, whether you're buy and hold, flipping, you're, you're going to have to deal with this. Uh, and we couldn't get any more Chicago than this. We have third generation owner of Kohl's Appliances. Uh, been there in the same location, just a wonderful story. Uh, has been a huge value to our business. Um, we, we've switched over and started using them recently. Uh, I know Jeff Weinberg, we've had on the show, he, he made the introduction. Uh, he's been using them at Drexel Properties for years, uh, but so excited to talk about all the different things here. So with us today, uh, third generation owner of Kohl's Appliances, Kevin Krasny. Kevin, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me, guys. So we're going to dive in here, but before doing that, it's such a cool background. It's such a great history. L- Kohl's Appliances, when did you guys start in Chicago? Give us that two minute tutorial of just how long you guys have been in that North Center location. Yeah, my grandfather, uh, Abe Krasny, opened the doors 75 years ago, back in 1946. And we've been on the same Lincoln Avenue corner ever since. So 1946, so is World War II over yet even? Are we still yep. in war? Yeah, no, we're over. Done. War is over. Came back and time to build and hustle. Well, give us a little history. How, how do you end up on that corner? How did maybe your family end up in that neighborhood? Any, uh, any insight there? 
You know, it's a, it was a very German blue collar neighborhood. Uh, it's the North center. It's kind of positioned right between Lincoln square and I guess Lakeview. Um, I believe his uncle had a business on the same corner, a uh, neighborhood supply store. He worked for him for a little, uh, bought out the business and turned it into Cole's appliance and furniture, which brought us to where we are today. In for 75 years to one survive is awesome, but then two not become national. Right. It's a very it's a very unique story where, hey, we're still here. We're still rocking this corner. Like, was there ever the temptation to be like, hey, we're going to open six more stores? You know, I think the secret to our success is the fact that we stayed small. Um, we do big business. We work with a lot of the trades and we're, we're primarily trade business. But I think the fact that we stayed small, stayed to our roots, kind of gave us a level of having better service. And I think it also... Uh, I think it's been the example of what's kept us going for 75 years, the true corner mom and pop style shop. Did you guys, so did your dad know he was taking it over? Did you expect to take it over? Are you rebellious? And uh... No, it was the last thing I ever planned on doing. Um, I don't think I ever, I still don't find appliances sexy. I don't, uh, <laughs> don't love the appliance world. I don't think I ever thought I was going to jump into the business, but when I joined, I was doing some other side things on the end. Uh, did a lot more furniture, quickly realized that appliances was our core business and kind of just dove right in. That's awesome. All right. So let's talk a little bit. It's been crazy. The supply chain has been just completely messed up. Talk, talk to us a little bit about how have things changed over the last, call it 12 months, 24 months, just with lead time, uh, availability. Like I know like we felt this firsthand um, and maybe you can break it down by some of the manufacturers you use. Cause I know not everyone's not everyone has had the same issues. Yeah, let, let not me, everyone's in the same boat. It's uh, let we, me say something real fast here, if, if yeah. you don't mind, before we get really rolling deep here. I, with the goal I want uh, the listeners, and I know the listeners would love this, is you know we all just buy. You know, damn, we need an appliance. You know, we we send an email somewhere that it gives a delivery date and it shows up. What I really want you to help Sometimes. us break down is some of the uh, the backstory of of what what's happening and and why people are getting long. Like yeah, so kind of what Tom said, but. Really uh, make sure you go into what, what we don't see on the, on the surface here. Yeah, yeah. From my end, I expected everything to be back to normal by now, and it's clearly far from it. And I think every manufacturer, every major manufacturer is dealing with major supply chain, component issues. Everyone's hands tied are across the board, and especially manufacturers that are shipping from Southeast Asia are having bigger conflicts than manufacturers, say, like a Sub-Zero Wolf that's shipping out of Madison, Wisconsin, or Fitchburg, Wisconsin. So we kind of see it across the board. Um, everyone's in a bad spot. Some manufacturers are just handling it a little bit better than others. And ultimately speaking, I think uh, the things that have changed is before I didn't have to warehouse appliances. Every manufacturer, we're in Chicago, we're in a big market. Every manufacturer had a warehouse locally, placed our order, had whatever we needed within a week. These days, the merchandise that I'm filling warehouses with now and, and holding probably 10 times or more inventory than normal, I ordered a year ago. So we kind of positioned ahead of this, put a ton of stock orders in, and that's currently what we're selling now to get away from the lead times of you know high-end appliances are taking 12 months to get now. That's crazy. So if, if I'm an investor and I'm just you know doing my my normal, you know, call it B grade rental. Yep. What what are what are the timelines looking like right now? I need yeah. I need the usual appliances, dishwasher, washer dryer, et cetera. Yep. That's getting easier in the sense that we've learned over the past couple of years of how to work the market differently. Um, we understand that people that are flipping these apartments, depending on sale of the apartment, um, sale price or location, you know, we know people need a twenty five hundred dollar package or a five thousand dollar package. So what we've been doing is getting ahead of the inventory, filling our warehouses. So we're still turning those orders around in a weekly time, if not less. So one to two weeks, we're turning around all those kind of low to mid-level orders. Um, but at the same time, there's certain manufacturers, I think, that are, you know, building in other, other areas where they're having trouble getting components. And we found stronger partners like GE, where GE moved the most production to Louisville, Kentucky, I think that's the perfect brand for like the CD properties where we can kind of get it quickly, turn it around, but it's also a reliable product. So you're saying when GE um, saw these problems, they, they shifted how they're manufacturing based on location. Where were they before uh, Louisville? 
you know, I think they were a little bit all over the place. And uh, I think a big push came after Hire purchased them. They did a big push into Louisville, Kentucky, and they did the majority of their manufacturing there, where a lot of it was coming from overseas before. And they've also scaled their business in the sense of saying, maybe we don't need 536 inch French door refrigerators. And they were able to switch that to having less SKUs, less models, but in return, a faster turnaround time on production. Oh, I, I love that. So that they, less options too for, for people. Which I think is a good thing overall. I mean, a lot of the time we didn't need four of the same refrigerators with one different feature on it. Yep. Black Ford Model T going back to old roots there. I, exactly. I like that mindset. So as far as, you know, we've all seen price prices go up in the last uh, couple of years and, and the, the general conversation is COVID and inflation <laughs> and supply chain. So those are the three things. There's just three words that come out and everyone just kind of walks away from the conversation. But you, you just said something here that's totally different. Do you think a, uh, a lot of people are moving towards this whole warehousing concept as an industry? And do you think uh, that so some of these increases might be around additional costs for suppliers and then also uh, supply chain type uh, issues? I think we're holding more products. Our overhead's clearly up higher with, you know, securing more warehouse space and having more merchandise on hand. In return, though, we didn't really internally raise our margins any differently, though. So that's kind of more us absorbing where all the price increases are coming from the manufacturer. And then that's where pricing is going up from there. I think one of the pain points that we all felt, uh, I call it last year, was, all right, the fridge costs $700 to repair but it costs, it takes eight weeks to get a fridge or six, even four weeks to have a tenant to go without having a fridge is, is a big problem. And, uh, I think, uh, we're okay even paying more now that things have kind of fluctuated down as long as we get it next week. Yep. We've, uh, we've been great in the sense that for the past few years, we've kept our lead times no longer than two weeks on turnarounds. And I mean, we, we have the luxury of so much retention and working with the same customers all the time. We know when someone needs something or when a landlord has a, uh, a tenant with a down fridge, we leave holes in our schedule to be able to turn deliveries around next day, um, even same day in some situations. So I think that's been another advantage of us being small is that we can accommodate it differently. We can care. And I can speak to that. I mean, you guys have done that multiple times for us. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about just the logistics behind the scene. So I place an order with you, Kev, you know, talk to us, what happens next all the way, you know, walk us through that, that workflow all the way to the time it is installed at the property. Yeah. Ideally we have the product that we're selling you in stock. Um, that's the easier game. We schedule delivery. And in we, stock, is it sitting in North center there or sitting in North center, either in the back of our, we have a warehouse in the back of our store. We have another warehouse that's like less than a mile away. And then we warehouse stuff that we know we'll be sitting on for six months, four plus months in a warehouse that's out, uh, out by Franklin Park. So we'll, so we'll, depending on what we have, we'll warehouse. And that's just because we're also writing orders now six to 12 months in advance, but we don't have a guarantee to get that higher end product in time. So we have to sit on it and hold it for that amount of time. But in general, something you order for a property, um, say you order a four piece GE package, we will order the appliances with GE if we don't have them in stock. We can see GE's uh, warehouse live. Um, so we can see their stock, know what they have. So if we see that GE is 130 refrigerators in stock, we'll place the order. GE generally get us a shipment within three days. Now, because of their labor shortages and just volume, they're up to about seven to 10 days um, for that shipment to arrive in our warehouse. Once it arrives in our warehouse, our team checks it in, contacts you know your delivery contact, and then we schedule delivery installation from there. Got it. And then, like, how big is your delivery team? Like, how many guys do you have running around here? Yeah, yeah. As of right now, we're running. We run one full time truck with three guys. Stuff's heavy, so we we've, we've added a third guy just to guarantee we're moving faster, and more efficiently. We're running that truck six days a week. Um, we're running two to three, three outside installation teams. So that could be anyone from one person in a van to two people in a van. Um, installation teams can also run smaller deliveries, double ovens, dishwashers, microwaves. And then we also work with probably at least a half a dozen outside installers that for overflow, we'll bring them on just to keep us caught up through the week. Talk to me about, uh, I'm always curious about the behind the scenes. Um, you know, you are one company of, how many in this country do you think that there are out there of uh, you? 
maybe uh, not, you're, you're, you're no different than a Home Depot, right? In the sense of, in maybe the supplier's mindset, like how, how many of are those do you think? Yeah, we're dwindling. There's less and less small guys in the game. Um, people always wonder how we compete. And it's like you mentioned the Home Depot. I, I love the big box stores because competing with service is, is obviously we can, that's not a, even a, not a challenge whatsoever. We can compete with their service, but pricing also. I mean, the industry is a tight margin industry. We keep a good finger on what our competition's at, but we can, com- we can compete with price. We can compete with service easily. And then the fact that every year there's less and less of us. So there's just not a lot of small guys out there that kind of gives us a unique advantage. So uh, more kind of behind the scenes, just questions like, so you have a rep at each one of these major appliances that you deal with them. And that's how you guys uh, uh, work on your business throughout the year, as far as uh, inventory, they're updating you on pricing. And is that how the behind the scenes works? Yeah, correct. We generally have, most manufacturers will have like an outside sales rep, like a Sub-Zero Wolf is a good example. Um, We'll have an outside sales rep that will call on us, you know, very responsive. We can get them whenever we need them, basically acting as a member of our team. Um, Same goal, sell as much Sub-Zero Wolf product as we can. Same goal he has. And then we also have inside reps and then the inside teams with them. So when we need inventory questions or we need to have something like immediately rushed out of a warehouse or picked up at a warehouse, we can go straight to like the inside team member who's, you know, always in the office Monday through Friday and kind of get the support we need. And I think us being around 75 years too, we've kind of shown the businessmen that we are, the loyalty that we have to certain manufacturers. So we see that in return a lot. I think we might get a higher level of customer service than one employee calling from a store that has, you know, 200 other employees who's calling them 15 times a day. Like when I call, they know me, they're asking how my daughter is, you know, they, uh, my daughters are, they, uh, they know us personally. So it's, it's a good relationships that we've built. Talk to me, the manufacturing landscape has changed too over the last uh, 20 years, as far as consolidation, who are, who are like the top five major players and how does that break down versus like, uh, landlord grade versus like owner or call it yeah. uh, high end flip or, or maybe owner occupy type grade. Yeah. It's getting scary because a lot of everyone's getting bought up by everyone else. It's making all product virtually the same on the high end. You know, I'm a big believer in sub zero wolf. You're flip, you're flipping single family homes. I think sub zero wolf is a hard name to compete with. What I like about it is the quality. It's a product that, you know, they run a, they build in Fitchburg, Wisconsin. So they have a unique advantage of being close Um, But they run a very smart, tight ship. They test 100% of their product before it hits the market. I think that's comparable to about 10% of the competition testing their products. We rarely ever open up a product and see damage, which you can wait a long time for a special order piece, have it come out of the box damaged, we're back to square one. Sub-Zero Wolf, we don't have that worry. Um, We also don't see service issues. And the most important things and what we see more and more these days, while I think people are rushing through production, we're seeing certain manufacturers, we're seeing more service, more merchandise out of the box needing service. And in today's market where service techs are hard to come by and parts are hard to come by, that's it's, it's not beneficial to us, the builder or anyone involved. Got it. Um, have a lot of our listeners are long, you know, long-term buy and hold guys, guys and gals. Give us an idea of what are some things we can do proactively to minimize repairs down the road, whether it's buying certain manufacturers or, you know, certain things, what are some things we can do to kind of protect ourselves? So we're not getting that, you know, repair call 18 months down the road. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I lean towards, and a lot of the, my landlord people holding properties, a lot of the property managers, I like the GEs. I like the Bosch's for more, a little bit higher mid end. Um, I think they're building for a good longevity. I think appliances, you know, are not going to last 40, 50 years. Like they did, you know, nothing's built to last the way it used to be. And I think a good life on appliances now is 10 to 10 to 15 years, 10 to 12 years is what most manufacturers in that level are building for. Um, we do see a lot of these newer companies like the um, LGs and the Samsungs, and these Korean electronics companies that have all the beautiful features. They have the TV in the door. They have all these great things. Problem is we see more and more service issues in a much shorter lifespan on some of that product. So I'm a big one on staying away from the bells and whistles. Mm-hmm. Um, when I talk to someone who's got a six unit building, who's going to be holding on to these units, renting these units, I don't, I normally don't recommend water dispensers in the door of the refrigerator. One more issue to go wrong. I generally try to stay away from the stuff that's very high, full featured, um, even top load washers instead of front load washers, where 
If you don't take the proper maintenance and clean the rubber seal around the door, it gets moldy. Tenants are not going to maintain the products of the same way. So I think just kind of the less features, reliable brands, and uh, kind of going more base models is almost a smarter route for, for those properties. Got it. Do you guys do Mark. any, uh, do you guys do any repair work? Or do you guys do maintenance? We don't do repair in house. And I actually see it as an advantage of us because what I'm seeing now where certain manufacturers are having higher repair issues, I'm seeing certain stores that do repairs in house push those products more. Uh, my goal is to sell you something and I don't want to hear from you again, unless you're introducing me to a friend who bought a building that you want to buy appliances or you bought another building. But I don't want you to call me that your appliances are broken because your tenant's unhappy, you're unhappy, my team's unhappy because it's more work. Where certain stores that do all service in house, they like those phone calls because service is a lot more profitable than sales. Um, and I also, I guess that leads me to like on a product when there is an issue, I also don't think anyone wants the store that sold them the appliance to come out and repair that same product. If it's me and I'm under warranty, I want GE to come out and tell me why there's something wrong with my refrigerator. I don't necessarily want the, the tech who delivered it to me to tell me there's an issue because I don't know where that issue arose from. Talk to me about your mindset around uh, installing uh, versus uh, not. I, I see a lot of uh, investors say, oh, just deliver them and I'll have my guy install them to, to save a couple of bucks. I, I imagine you guys do do install. and then We do, we do a lot of install. I'd say we do 50% of our jobs, we do installation. Some reason, I feel like 50 to 60%. So probably the majority of the jobs we do installation on basic kitchens, it doesn't really worry me if contractors or builders want to do their own. They're doing the uh, they're doing the hard work. They have to get their gas lines ready. They have to get their electrical ready. So if it's part of their plumber or their electrician scope of work to also finish the connection, I don't see any issue with that. Um, some of the higher end products, custom kitchens with Sub Zero Wolf, where refrigerators are taking custom cabinetry door panels. I think you leave that to the experts and let our team who does this on a daily basis, take care of that. But on basic kitchens, like if it was me personally and I was doing a six or 12 unit building, I would most likely have my contractor do it. Um, I also see issues where I walk into those buildings and on day of installation, there's no gas shutoff valves. Our team can't just hook up the range. And if we install a gas shutoff valve, it's an additional charge that you already paid your plumber to do. So in that end, I think it kind of keeps your trades honest at the same time. So Tom, honestly, I, I've done this a couple of times. And so I'm asking the question, have you ever not left uh, you maybe off a half inch on your counter where your, your range doesn't fit? Yeah, we've messed up and we've messed up timeline too. We're like, I placed the order. Chris told me like, Hey, you know, we'll have the countertops in. Everything will be ready at this point. It's not, I don't check back in all of a sudden appliances are delivered. And we're like, all right, put them in the dining room. <laughs> we'll figure this <laughs> out. But along those lines, can you give us, you know, just like the checklist, what has to happen for a basic kitchen to go in? right? Like what, what do you need as a contractor to time this up? Yeah. And we, we over communicate this. So, I mean, we love, I love when I'm involved and I know cabinet makers countertops so I can find out everyone's schedule and be on those emails. So we'll, we'll adjust our schedule quickly. I can't tell you how many times we, we get a phone call on day of, or we're calling morning of delivery to confirm our time. And the contractor on site tells us the floors were stained that morning and we can't come in. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. We're good at repositioning that, but generally speaking for appliances, we're the last ones in the door. I don't care if your cleaning team has already been there, you know, we'll come in, we'll be neat. We'll get delivered, installed, but cabinets need to be in all connections. Um, countertops should be in. I love when the final coat of the floor is not on just in case um, we scuff anything, but we're used to being the last ones through the door and, and have every single thing completed. And I guess a lot of, we don't do it as much with our, our mid end projects, which maybe we should, but on all high end projects, we won't dispatch an installation team until we have, I shouldn't say won't, we generally request not to dispatch an installation team until we have full photos of all the spaces that show the connections. So our installers can do a quick run through and you know, circle back where an electrical outlet needs to be moved or if a space doesn't look to be the proper size, things along those, things like that nature. Did that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's, that, that's good stuff. And we've messed the flooring one. We definitely messed up multiple times. <laughs> we see we it. At the installer. Yeah, no, we see it, especially today being a Monday. You know what I mean? Why my, my team will start calling deliveries and people are going to be behind and some will scramble to put it in the living room somewhere some will, uh, some will just push us off for a week or two and it gets trickier 
the worst or most stressful time is always the last week of the month because people have tenants moving in on the first, they're pushing timelines to finish construction and they need to get the appliances on site to kind of bang out this whole last weekend just to have the places ready for, for Monday moving. I'd love to have the conversation right now about kind of repair versus replace. Cause I think that comes up often. I know you don't do the, uh, the, the repair side of things, but I think you have enough insight on what is what, like any, I mean, Tom, you have feedback too, like any kind of rule of thumbs that you have of like, Hey, if it's, if it's over nine, I and mean, for me, like for a dishwasher, it's like, all right, if it's over nine years old, like it's, it's probably, it's just, I don't want to send a tech out there. I'd rather just replace it. Like what, what do you guys, how you guys make your determinations on that or how you advise uh, investors to look at those scenarios? Cause what I hate happening, I hate when I send a guy out there to tell me I should replace it. <laughs> so I got you, I got to yeah. pay him the 85 bucks or whatever, whatever he could negotiate his fee down to only to turn around and, and pay X amount hundreds of dollars for a new one. What's your guys' thoughts on that? Both of you guys. Yeah. Here. yeah. And that's, that's changing a lot. So I do, I use a similar eight to 10 years. If you got a dishwasher in a rental unit called a $400 dishwasher, eight years old, it breaks. By the time you pay the repair tech a hundred dollars to come to the house, then he tells you he can get the parts. These days, parts are very hard to come by. So a lot of them are recommending you replace it, but you're spending somewhat $100, $200, 50% of the cost of a new dishwasher just to band-aid that, that you hope to get another year or two out of it. I mean, those dishwashers aren't running 15, 20 years anymore. So I, I agree with the eight to 10 year mark. Um, high end is a little bit different. A sub-zero fridge should run for 25 years. So that, that's worth putting a little bit of, of money into that. Um, yeah. But same game. It also depends how many times have I repaired this washer? You know, if I've had it for eight years, I've had three or four service calls on it. Maybe it's time to put a new washer in there. Tenants beat up appliances. You know, tenants aren't taking care of their appliances. They're overloading washers. They're, they're not all tenants, obviously, but the majority of tenants are beating up. So they're hard on appliances, which makes them turn around quicker. Yeah. I think one of the biggest tips uh, for our listeners while I'm thinking about that I've been jammed on many times is the stackable washer and dryers where on the washing machine, those, uh, those are very small drums. You put more than five or six towels in there, wet towels. You break one of those, uh, um, whatever, one of the three, uh, uh, springs underneath. And it ends up being like a $500 type, uh, repair. And, and you start questioning, do you replace it? But, uh, I guess the, the tip there I'll give is, uh, uh to the listeners is, uh, make sure you warn your, if you have stackable, make sure the bottom or your tenant knows not to overload that. Otherwise they could be responsible for that cost. Yeah, I have uh, I have one property owner who started putting, uh, I don't know if it's in his lease or what, but he put a clause in there about overloaded washers will not be replaced till after they move out. And he had one building, six units used the same washer, and he the thing broke every 30 days like clockwork. Everyone that came out told him the same thing. These are being overloaded. These machines are not meant to take this much weight, but people are waiting two weeks doing all their laundry, sheets, towels, clothes. And he just, repl he refused after he replaced two of them that he will not replace the washer again. Man, I have a, just a funny story. I have a, um, a guy, he's, he's from Italy and he, he's been here probably 20 years and he bought a building on the North side and he owns the building next door and he got pissed about the tenant keep breaking the, the washer. So he literally hung up a, a dry, it was a dryer that kept frying out because they're, I don't know, whatever it was, but he hung a string between the two buildings and told them to hang their stuff out there. <laughs> <laughs> like so old school, I'm like, man, it doesn't work here, man. Like you can't do that. It's not like. This is not the Palermo or anything. Like you just can't do that, man. It's not going to work. No, it, it's true. And I guess to get back to an earlier question you said with brands, like there is Speed Queen Laundry, which I always recommend to these people that have, you know, they have bigger buildings, multiple units using the laundry machines. They don't want to necessarily use the coin out machines, but Speed Queen builds the same commercial coin out machines for residential use. So you're paying more, but these units can be beat up. They could be overloaded and they're going to last 20, 25 years because they're built with all commercial parts. So you might spend twice as much from the initial start, but your machine's lasting twice as long, no service calls on it. So I think that buying the right merchandise also is the, the right move in some of these units. So you're, spe so you're saying Speed Queen has a non-coin operated uh, machine that uh, people would use to be more heavy duty even. Um, oh, wow. I never knew that. Yeah. Dur during the pandemic, they stopped building the residential because they build up in Wisconsin as well. Their factory can only handle so much. So they concentrated only on commercial, which is, you know, the coin op, which is their core business. But now the residential machines are back in. They, uh, they decided it wasn't worth using different parts and different motors and different transmissions. Just keep them all commercial built. Don't add coin kits. And uh, they definitely have a market for it. 
Are you, are you guys, do you guys sell that product as well too? the coin? We, we do a lot of, yes, we do both. What's uh, your thoughts on, uh, you know, I, I think to me, it's like sliced bread, the whole kind of uh, the uh, pay range or the, the ones that you don't need the coins anymore. What, what's your thought on that? And how, how's that selling, I guess? When well, store? First define pay range for, for our listeners who don't, yep. might not Sorry. have used it. We'll, we'll just give them a quick little plug here. Our so market. go on what end for what's... Uh... So Wait, I, guess, I guess I'll do it. So Mark, oh. Mark mentioned pay range for our listeners who don't know, it's a Bluetooth device. You can hook up to a speed queen or other manufacturers. And so the tenant can just make payment through the phone. They don't have to actually physically go get quarters. Everything's done through the phone. It's very simple. They send you a report each week of how much you're using. You can incorporate into your QuickBooks or whatever. It's a very slick system. And I think they take like 3% up the top or whatever. It's like a, almost like a credit card transaction fee, but it's, it's a better experience for the tenants. And also I, I feel they, they use it more, right. Cause they're just pushing a button. It's kind of like not real money to them, <laughs> you know, like, like casino chips. It's not real. No, sure. the jukebox, those electronic jukeboxes. Now they yes. have these days. I, I spent, <laughs> I spent $98 on my fishing trip on the jukebox. <laughs> um, so they go ahead just to level set when Mark mentioned pay range. Let's go back. So to go back to the question, like, let's talk about like, do you see a lot of people still doing coin do you see a lot more going to this, you know, I don't know, you know, I call it handless transaction. Yeah. I'm seeing less and less coin operated in general. And I don't know if that's more people, which I see a lot of renovation rehabs, more people going in unit laundry. So I think as a whole, yep. we're seeing a little bit more less basement laundry. We still sell a lot of the coins, you know, always set between a dollar 25 and $2 for a load. Seems to me it'd be a nightmare to go empty out those change things every uh, probably 30 days or they pile up. So obviously being able to use digital, like you said, is an advantage because people don't consider the money the same. They're not digging through quarters. If you don't have quarters, you might not do laundry that day. Um, but I, I am seeing more of the residential machines put in. So I don't know if people are raising rents and just not dealing with the pay for laundry, You know, kind of offering a nicer luxury experience that you have free laundry in the building and they're just paying for it on a different end. Yeah, I, I think it's important. I think the newest generations of renters um, they definitely didn't grow up going to a laundromat or going down to a basement uh, and a lot of different levels. And I think the um, having uh, in-unit laundry is probably the first and foremost, anyone listening, if you can make that happen, make it happen. Um, and even if it's just a hookup and figure out the appliance piece later, have them bring their own, which I'm not a fan of, but I'd rather you do that than, than do it in the coin. Cause if you, if you're creating, even if you put the coin laundry, people look at it as like a true revenue generator. And, and unless you have scale, you know, to have a coin laundry in four units, I mean, you're really basically um, paying to clean that laundry area. Um, cause you know, people forget that. All right. Now you have a laundry room and yeah, you can put on the tennis to keep it clean, but you got to come through a couple of times a year and make sure the place cleaned up and, you have uh, issues or if one of those breaks, you know, if, if you're not buying, you know, a lot of people try to go coin and buy used. <laughs> so they're going to have mm -hmm. repair costs in the first few years. So uh, I, I think I always tell people to just take a very closer look at what uh, you know, p uh, that revenue line is truly going to net you at the end of the day. Yeah. To piggyback on that too, if you're paying for management, sometimes they'll even charge the tech to go out there. Yeah, right? no. <laughs> so yeah, we do 150 bucks in quarters. <laughs> you just paid 50. To, yeah. So I, I think for us, the work. yeah, for us, I think we charge 30 bucks. Now we try to tie it in with like common area clean or something like that. But if, if it's, uh, and the other problem we run into, cause we don't want to charge that to clients is we try to push that. Like, can we do it every other month? But then all of a sudden you get the, Hey, the washing machine's not working. Is then right away when we know the washing machine's not working, we haven't picked up coins in a month and a half Then we know right away, that's the issue. We go do it, but you know, we try to be efficient about it. And sometimes you run into those issues. Yeah. So, Kev, you mentioned, you know, we're talking about some of the things that are changing here, like the the pay range. What do you foresee over the next call at five years changing the industry? Like you mentioned some other players coming in, you know, Samsung, et cetera. Where do you see this landscape going? What are, what are some yeah. things that you're either excited about or that you're saying, like, well, this is going to be this is going to be different? Yeah, I don't like that the scope keeps getting smaller and smaller with less manufacturers. I, I mean, I think competition is a good thing for all industries. Um, so that's one thing where I see. I hope that some of these smaller brands continue to get stronger. You know, the Fisher Paykels, the Bertazzoni's brands that aren't talked about as much, but I hope they can get stronger without just getting gobbled up by somebody bigger. Um, I think on the competition aspect, like what I'm excited for is I see less competition in the future. It seems all my competition is either concentrated on either scaling their business and seeing how many stores they can open and what locations or just growing into the big box store. And when you get to that big, it makes competition easier. They can't give the same level of service and they're just, they're concentrated on uh, 
they're concentrated on their business more than they are their customer. Well, I think you have the opportunity too, similar to us, like in property management, there's guys that run in 10 different markets and, and they might only have a few hundred doors, but they're in smaller markets. You, we have Chicago here. Like we could, we could grow our business 10 X and still not have to leave uh, the neighborhoods. Like it, it's uh, I, I think we have that unique opportunity just being here in Chicago for anyone with a small business, I, I think. Yeah, I think I think mostly investors probably hear it both ways. I think a lot of investors who are probably buying up a lot in Texas or buying up a lot in Florida might look at Chicago market and not understand why we're here. But I think we have I think we have a very unique city. This city is not going anywhere. Um, I think we're the strong. I wouldn't want to be in any other market, to be honest. Everything about Chicago, I think, is great. And I mean, I'm born and raised Chicago and true and true. And I love this city and will always be here. But I think there's a lot that the city has to offer and and. And we, uh, we're not going to see any lacks of property. And I don't ever see, I don't see rents going down. I don't see, I think this is just going to grow a market. Any, any, uh, because this is your, your background, is there any changes around appliance? I mean, appliances have been pretty much the same sort of feature wise for the last 50 years. Like, is there ever going to be like the, the oven, fridge, dishwasher, all in one, like, like <laughs> right. space saver, like is, is the, all, the all in one, it goes back to my more features in one product, more to break. Um, I do think it's like, we see a lot of trends and a lot of that comes on the higher end where like steam ovens are the new thing taking over the industry. Maybe not necessarily for the it's not the landlord's not going to put that into a property manager's not going to put that into a property with the nice features but there is high end properties. And I'm sure you guys have listeners who are, you know, building single family homes, possibly renting, you know, much nicer condo units. And those are the features we're seeing panel ready refrigerators, um, steam ovens, um, not a lot of the all in one combos, but steam ovens are taking the place of microwaves and high end homes. Really question for, for our audience. Cause I think this comes up and I see people make this mistake all the time. They, order an electric uh, dryer when they have a gas or the a gas uh, <laughs> stove when they have electric. How do people look at their, without pulling it out, how, how do they know based on a tag? Is it on there? G- give some kind of, give, give your landlord tip of the week here on this one. Yeah. We don't like headaches. So we overly ask if someone orders an electric dryer, immediate red flag, just because we're selling 99 gas dryers to, you know, one electric. Um, so the first thing we do, even if they're confident, because a gas dryer does plug in. So to most people that's electric. But an electric dryer has a big 240 volt plug. You know, you can't plug a vacuum into it. Um, So one thing we do is we have them just send us, and we do this in a lot of our property flips. We have them send us pictures of the model serial tags. Every appliance has a model serial tag, a sticker on it. We can then archive the specs so that we can kind of confirm, you know, what's in place. And I guess that works a lot well for a lot of these people flipping units. First thing I ask them is, what are you selling the unit for? What are you running the unit for? What are the dimensions of what's currently in place? And then we have them send us an email with pictures, you know, standing back further so we can see context. Also pictures of the model serial tag. So I can see on the model number that their fridge is 36 inch wide, 70 inch tall. I can see there's a couple extra inches. If we went with the taller fridge, I can also get better t- context if they need to um, pay more for a counter depth refrigerator than a regular depth refrigerator. They'll make the space live better. Um, so we try to do our homework so we don't have those headaches upon delivery. What about uh, for somebody that, that gets a work order today and they're trying to figure out how old this appliance is? Is, is it as easy as just Googling up the, the SKU or what, what's the best way to figure out how old an appliance is? Generally, that serial tag will have a date on there. So that's the number one hope. When you look at that serial tag, you'll see a date. If not, we Google it and just try to find with archived information from the manufacturer of you know the rough age of it. Gotcha. Yeah. Kev, one question I have when we're talking about trends. I'm seeing a lot of new construction. They're just jamming the microwave in the pantry to create more counter space. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the the actual kit and the built-in. Yeah. Um, and then just from a usability, when we put it low, like in the island, my kids can use it. Yes. So uh, like, I'm a big fan of that, but I'm seeing like a lot of people just jamming this thing in the pantry. What, uh, what are thoughts? What are you seeing out there? Very common. We're seeing less and less microwaves. We do see the microwave drawers below countertop. Great for kids to use. Um, a lot of people are going steam ovens, their steam oven, you can do everything you can do in a microwave, but reheat liquid or pop popcorn. So then a lot of those people are just sticking that extra microwave in a pantry. I'm someone who has a microwave hidden in a pantry. Um, I rarely ever use it. And, and I, we're seeing less of it that what I don't like about the microwaves with the built-in trim kits built into the cabin tree is I, from my understanding, every microwave comes from one or two factories in China. 
Microwaves are thrown away items. They don't have all the same specs. So replacement on, if you're holding on to a property and you're doing, you know, a built-in microwave, the trim kit, when it comes time to replace it, it gets much trickier than just buying a cheap, you know, hundred dollar microwave, which yep. ultimately does the same thing as a built-in microwave with a trim kit, but manufacturers know you want to buy that stainless steel trim around it. So they're going to charge you $200 for the microwave and then $200 for that stainless steel trim that wraps it. Any one more question. I mean, we got stainless, we got white. Is there any new like colors or anything like that? Like that's going with the new. Let's get back to the avocado. Yeah. yeah. Right. Bring that <laughs> avocado green back to the party. Um, stainless is still King. Um, tenants will even pay more rent for stainless, uh, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> we see a lot more like matte black and matte white, like G cafe has gone that trend with matte white, matte black. Then they offer gold handles. So we're seeing a little bit more of those accessories um, options on there, but we're not seeing a lot of other colors outside like panel ready fridges and panel ready dishwashers to match the cabinetry. Um, I always look at like the Sub-Zero Wolves because when they, they're the only company building for that 25 year life and the fact that they really only make their stuff in stainless steel, maybe you can switch out red or black knobs, but they're kind of showing that that stainless steel trend is, is not a trend. It's here to stick. And for them to build a black refrigerator and have it be out of style in 10 years, isn't the right move either. Yeah, man. Good stuff. Mark, any other questions you want to geek out on here? No, I, I think uh, I dug out a couple of weird ones and you gave some awesome answers as far as feedback to our listeners that I know uh, people aren't sure about. So that was awesome. Cool. Let's wrap this. All right. You ready? I, I think you're prepared for these. So you should be ready, which means that the expectations of all the listeners now that I said you prepared for it, it's going to be that much higher. So no pressure. Kind of prepared. We got Monday morning here. We're going to say that to every, regardless of the guest has prepared or not. <laughs> Just put them on the spot. All right. What is, uh, what is your competitive advantage? How have you been able to do this while so many others have, you know, it, uh, closed up, uh, grown out of the market or so forth? I mean, I think staying small has been the secret to our success. Um, we're big enough to serve, but we're small enough to give that level of customer service and attention that our clients need. Um, we also didn't grow too fast. I mean, we were one of those businesses that we've been there 75 years and we've been slowly growing and have built a great business, but we've stayed true to our roots and still have that same mom and pop corner shop. doesn't matter how much business we do. We still have that feel. Um, and then also just 75 years of building relationships in the industry and proving who we are has given us a, a very unique advantage. So Kevin, you can answer this either through general lens or through, you know, appliance lens, but what is one piece of advice you would tell someone that is yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? I mean, I think knowing your neighborhoods is huge. Um, the city grows and expands quick. So knowing your neighborhoods. And then I think, uh, look at your utilities, know how old your furnace is, know how old your refrigerator is, know what you're walking into on a, on a property that you're buying. Oh man, I'm sorry. I got to throw in a question here, uh, based on that, like, Home warranties. So many, I get questioned with the, the all the time. Uh, do you recommend people buying home warranties at closing? I think like overall home warranties are great that cover everything in your home. I don't always recommend extended warranties and some of my staff does. And I do personally look at it as a money maker for the store on an extended warranty on appliance. Um, you can only buy up to five years. Most appliances come with a one to two year parts and labor warranty Generally speaking, if you don't see a problem within the first year, you don't see one until after five years. So I think like extended warranty on appliances is a money maker for the stores and not, necess not necessary for the client or the buyer. But I do think home warranties are interesting because when your uh, your furnace breaks, it's nice to know that that's going to be replaced under your home warranty, and that does cover a lot of your appliances as well. So it's a lot of just overall coverage that I think is is priceless. It's cheap right. too. What do you do for fun? Fun. Um, I, uh, I love spending time with my wife and two daughters. We spend a lot of time at the beach. Um, I mountain bike a lot. Uh, I bike on the street a lot. And then any morning that I can, I try to paddleboard out on the lake. So I like to paddleboard before I go into work in the morning. And then I see a ton of music. So live music is probably my, uh, what I do more at night than anything else. Nice. Favorite venue in Chicago? Great question. Um, I think I got to give a shout out to my buddy because I love his spot, but the chop shop in, uh, on North Milwaukee and Damon in Bucktown, I the chop shops got a little butcher shop restaurant slash music venue. So it's got a great, great 
the great of all three worlds. I love food um, and I love music. So I love going to the shop shop. Nice. We'll link to it. All right. What is a good book, podcast, or self-development activity that you'd recommend to our listeners? Podcast. I'm loving the All In podcast right now. Um, very tech and political and newsworthy, but I get a wealth of information from uh, All In podcast. And then Broken Record, which is Rick Rubin's new music podcast that has been beyond inspiring. All right. Besides yourself, name one person in your local network that you'd highly recommend to other investors. My hardest question, because I work with so many trades and, and so many different people. And I think uh, maybe Matt Custis from MKA Architecture, who uh, also happens to be my brother-in-law, but I really tracked on that because I think an architect on a lot of these new construction projects is priceless. I see people go into some of these projects without an architect and he kind of shapes the whole project from the start. And I think that's a, a good place to start. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that, that sentiment. Like that, if you don't have that foundation correct, like the whole project's going to blow up on you. That's true. I see people spend a lot more money um, trying to save some money at the beginning. Yep. So Kevin, thank you so much. You provide a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Uh, yeah. I mean, anyone out there, give your small guy a shot. doesn't matter what industry you're looking at, but uh, we're Coles Appliance and Furniture. We're at 4026 North Lincoln Avenue. Uh, I pretty much guarantee we'll be the, not only the most competitive pricing, highest level of service. We'll, uh, we'll have cocktails together. We'll do business together and, uh, build some relationships. There we go. Support Good us. plug there. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Mark, who we got a Chicago fact here. Who are we playing for? Mason Michaels bought a hoodie. He's out of uh, Tri Taylor. So, um, Mason, thank you for, uh, Buying a hoodie. I've seen a couple of hoodies get sold this past weekend. So everyone's preparing That's for winter. That's time of year. But uh, if we get this question right, you'll get a $50 gift card sponsored by Renovo. All right. So we said Kohl's was established in 1946. The mayor of Chicago in 1946. He was the first of five mayors to come out of Bridgeport. He never finished grammar school. He went straight into labor force at age 10. He was the mayor of Chicago in 1946. And your options are, Mark, Edward Joseph Kelly, Richard J. Daly, William E. Denver, Edward F. Dunn. I would say uh, Kelly. Kelly was right before Daly. Yep. Kevin, you want to you go with any? I'm going to go with Kelly, I think. You guys nailed it. Nice work. Nice, nice. All right. Daily was right. too obvious. I, I, I figured you wouldn't go that route, but I didn't know if you would know before that. I thought that maybe the Bridgeport gave it away. No, no, that, that's, it's amazing how many mayors came. That's how messed up our democratic, how de messed up slash cool slash dis, uh, discouraging <laughs> the system. Corrupt is. is the word you're trying to find. Yeah, yeah I, don't know, I don't know. But Mason Michaels, you get a $50 gift card. We'll send that out to you. Uh, thank you for uh, buying merch. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I'm excited we got that. So uh, thank you very much for coming on here to our show today. Tom, thank you as always. Uh, listeners, uh, you can go on to our merch store and get entered into our drawing to be on our uh, Chicago Fact and, and win a $50 gift card brought to you by Renovo. Please leave us a review, refer us to a friend. If you don't, you will not make money on your next slip. So please make sure <laughs> that you are referring, listening, and, and leaving us reviews. So thank you guys very much. And uh, listeners, we'll see you next week. Thanks all.